So good morning once again, you guys. <laughs> so happy to be here, so excited to be here. And it's a great day. It's a good day to be alive, amen? It's so much better than the alternative. Amen. So super excited to be here. Uh, my sermon entitled is, uh, as you see in the bulletins, it is Abide, parentheses, Stay with Jesus. So some of you have been here whenever I presented this. And so um, uh, let's just take a fresh look at this again. And so um, we're going to be, uh, if you will, uh, turn your Bibles with me uh, in John chapter 15. And so uh, while you're turning your Bibles with me in John chapter 15, I just want to say something. This might be a very familiar passage to uh, some of you, if not all of you. And so one of the, thing, one of the points I want to say is that it can always be a dangerous thing for a preacher to preach on a, fil- uh, on a familiar passage because people think that they know everything about a given passage. But just be very careful that you just don't get so familiar with Scripture that you think you know everything and that you can't learn anything from a given passage. Even passages like John chapter 3, verse 16, because I assure you there are gems of truth to be unpacked and to be uncovered, even in the most familiar verses of Scripture like that Scripture. So before we dive into uh, this uh, morning's uh, presentation and sermon, please bow your heads with me as we pray. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for this uh, beautiful Sabbath day. Thank you for all these beautiful people, Father. And uh, just thank you once again just for your, your love and your mercy. And I just ask, Lord, that you just, uh, just I'm a broken vessel, Father. And Lord, just pour. I'm coming, we're all coming to your fountain that is so filled with water, Father. So I ask that you just uh, fill us up with yourself, Father God. Uh, help uh, dispel anything that is unlike you, Father. Fill us with your love, your compassion. And just thank you once again, Father God. And I ask for your Holy Spirit. I uh, ask that you open the doors of our hearts, like the song says, and help us to uh, help us to just let you come in, Father God. You're knocking at the door of our hearts. So, Father, I ask that you just um, uh, speak through me. Help me to just simply be a channel, Father God, that you speak through, Father. So thank you once again, and I ask that you give, uh, bless every, every single individual here, Father God. Take all the nervousness that I may feel, because I'm really nervous, Father. But, Lord, you're so good and you're so kind. So thank you once again, Father God. And I just ask for your Holy Spirit once again, because we all need it. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. In your name we pray. We love you. Amen. Amen. And so we're going to be at John chapter 15. Uh, we're going to be spending the latter part. Actually, we're going to be spending uh, the latter part in, uh, John, uh, in John chapter 15, verse 3. But I just want to take, like I said, I just want to take a fresh look. And I, so I want you just to distill your mind about any thing you may know about this scripture, and let's just take a fresh look at this, these verses of scripture. So we're going to be in John 15, verses 1 through 8. So Jesus is speaking here. He says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. And here's our scripture reading for this, uh, for this morning. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do what? Nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them and throw them into the fire and they are burned. If you Guess what word Jesus is going to say? If you what? Abide in me, and my words abide in you. You will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. Last verse. By this my Father is glorified, that you will bear much fruit. So you will be my disciples. And so if you were to sort of distill this whole passage of Scripture to its most fundamental element, to one single word, what word do you think that would be? Piece of cake. Abide. Abide. See, you got it. Praise the Lord. And so Jesus says that some eight or nine or ten times in this passage. He says, abide, 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 abide. And so uh, is, is anyone reading, is anyone perhaps reading from the New International Version? Anybody? Well, if you're not, other translations, they don't use the word abide. They use the word remain. And so when you think about the word abide, when you think about the word remain, what exactly does that mean? It means to stay put. It means that you're in a place now stay there. You're in a place. Now stay there. And so there's a theological and a grammatical point to understand about the word abide. And it's very simple. It's very easy to understand. And it's that 
You cannot abide where you're not. Does that make sense? I can't continue to abide over there because I'm right here. You can't stay somewhere where you're not. Pizza cake, easy to understand. And so listen very closely here. The words are purposefully chosen. You cannot continue to abide where you do not presently reside. In other words, like, like we said before, you can't stay where you are if you're not there. So the idea of the word abide is that you're in a place, now stay there. For instance, if I were to say, hmm, let's say, uh, immediately following this morning's presentation, I would, I would like for you all to abide with me here in the sanctuary. Is that possible, yes or no? Yeah, sure it is, because you're already here. But let's say, immediately following this presentation, could you abide with me in Orlando? Is that possible, yes or no? No, it's not possible. Why? Because you're not there. Because you're not there. And so, I want to go back to the passage, and I want to go to, I want to read verses 1 through 3 now. Because verse 3 is the key to understanding this whole passage of Scripture. So we already discussed what the definition of abide is. You're in a place, now stay there. And you cannot stay where you aren't. And so let's go back to the passage, and let's begin in verse 1. Jesus says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. All right, here's the scripture reading. Key to understanding this whole passage. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. And what is the very first word in verse 4? It's abide. And so Jesus has to tell his disciples where they are before he can exhort them to stay there. Does that, make, does that make sense, everyone? Like, Jesus has to first give them confidence in their present tense position in Christ before he could tell them to stay there. I mean, it makes such logical sense. I mean, sometimes to a fault, but it just makes so much sense. And so, verse 3, you are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. So I want to talk about this word, you, for instance. So in the English language, we could use the word you to refer to singularity and plurality. For instance, if I were to say to my friend Matthew, hey, Matthew, can I go out to lunch with you? That's singularity. Or let's say I'm talking to a group of people, some four or five or even six people, and I'm just like, hey, why don't you just come over to my house? Will they then know that I'm talking about all of them, yes or no? I mean, sure they would. And so, but in the Greek, in the Greek, you have two U's. You have a U specifically for um, singularity, and then you have another U for plurality. And so, guess what, guess what Greek word is used here? It's a plural, it's a plural word. And so Jesus is talking to his disciples here. And so you could then insert the word, you are all already completely clean. And let's talk about the word already, for instance. So what does the word already mean? Is already something that's going to happen, is happening, or has happened? It's something that has happened. So, if our, for instance, if my mom were to tell me, hey, can, I, can you go take out the trash? And then I tell her, yes, I've already done that. She would then know that, hey, I've done it in the past, and mission is accomplished. And so it just makes such logical sense. And so Jesus says, you are already clean. You are clean as opposed to dirty. You're clean as opposed to impure because of the word that I have spoken to you. So what word is Jesus talking about here? And so commentators aren't exactly agreed on this, but I can assure you something I'm confident that Jesus was referring to. Jesus was referring to something that happened just roughly two hours before. Now, I say two hours. It could have been three hours. It could have been one hour. It could have been as long as five hours. But Jesus, in, in, uh, in the same day, he used similar language that would have made perfect sense to his, to his disciples because they would have been like, oh, Jesus said, this to the, Jesus, said, Jesus said this to us earlier, so it makes sense. So it would have clicked in their heads because he used the same identical language. And so, if you will... Keep your finger in John 15. I want to take you back to John chapter 13, if you will. Turn with, me, turn with me in your Bibles to John chapter 13. And John 13 is the Last Supper. And like I said, the, la the, uh, the time that could have transpired here could have been one hour, it could have been two hours, it could have been as much as five hours. And so Jesus, he's in the upper room washing his disciples' feet. And so, like we said earlier, it would have made perfect sense, as you're turning to John 13, it would have made perfect sense to his disciples when he said, you guys are all already completely clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. So John chapter 13, if you will, are you in John chapter 13, yes or no? Yes. Yes, okay. So Jesus is washing the disciples' feet. So now let's, 
Let's read, begin reading in John chapter 13. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, that he should depart from this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And supper being ended, the devil already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, that he had come from God and was going to God, he rose from supper, he laid aside his garments, he took a towel, and he girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. And so I want to paint this scenery here. The disciples are sitting at a table. And so Jesus, uh, uh, modern, modern, modern language here, Jesus takes a bowl, he fills the bowl with water. When it says he takes a towel and he girded himself, he took a towel and he wrapped himself with a towel. And then he began, one by one, to wash the disciples' feet. And so, let's just talk about this for a second. I mean, it's impossible for us in the 21st century to understand just the magnitude of this whole situation. Because foot washing, in Jesus' time, was a, it was a very common thing. A very, very common thing. It's, I mean, uh, if you were to visit someone's house, it was very common for people to have basins filled with water. In other words, waters, uh, uh, bowls filled with water, either just outside or just inside of their house. It's equivalent to having a welcome mat either just outside or inside of your house. And so it was this common courtesy. You would go before you go into somebody's house. You would wash your feet before entering. And so it was a very, very common thing. And so let's just talk about this for a second. I mean, foot washing itself was, was a very, very common thing. In fact, if you were to go, let's say, if you were to go, it was very, it was very common for people to go days without taking a shower. But God forbid you forget to wash your feet for a day, you're considered an uncivilized person. <laughs> an uncivilized person. And so foot washing, it had a very negative connotation to it. And so let's say, let's say if you were to visit a person with affluence or means, someone who's very, who's very wealthy, they would typically have servants that would come and, and would wash your feet. And so, um, and so let's say there were six people there. Uh, five of them were Jew and one of them was a Gentile. It was almost always the responsibility of the Gentile to wash the person's feet. So it had a very negative connotation to it. And let's just talk about how the illimitable, eternal, omnipotent creator of the universe is stooping to wash the disciples' dirty, dusty feet. So let's go back to the passage, and let's begin in, uh, let's go to verse, start in verse, let's read verse 5 again. And after that, Jesus, he poured water into a basin, and he began to wash the disciples' feet, and he began to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. Then he came to Simon Peter, and Peter said to him, Lord, are you washing my feet? Translation, Lord, are you kidding me? <laughs> Are you kidding me, Lord? You washing my feet? Uh, then Jesus answered and said to him, What I am doing you do not understand now, but you will know after this. And Peter said to him, Lord, you will never wash my feet. And so Peter here, in typical Peterine fashion, he protests. And so, continuing reading here, Jesus says, Hey, if, you don't wash, if I don't wash you, you have no part with me. And then uh, Jesus said to him, Oh, no, I mean, Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. In other words, like we said, Peter, in typical Peterine fashion, he's on one side of the spectrum. Lord, you will never wash my feet. And then the moment Jesus says, you will have no part with me, he's like, okay, I'm sorry, Lord, all the way on the other side of the spectrum. Just wash my, just give me a bath. Maybe wash my hair, give me a little shampoo, just give me a bath. <laughs> and so the washing of the disciples' feet it's a foreshadowing of the cross because it is Jesus alone who can reach into the deep crevices of our hearts that are so stained with sin and wash them. And so, going back to the passage, we go to verse 10. Jesus says, oh, remember, the reason why we came to John 13 is because we're trying to understand what did Jesus mean when he said, you guys are all already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. So we're trying to understand, what does Jesus mean when he's saying this? What, what, what is Jesus talking about? And so verse 10, Jesus said to him, he who was bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not all of you. And the but not all, but, and the but not all of you part is a reference to who? Judas Iscariot, who will then betray him. And so, I mean, 
This just makes so much logical sense. I mean, do you sort of see the similarity between John chapter 15, verse 3, and John chapter 13 when Jesus says, you guys are all already clean? Do you kind of see the similarity here, yes or no? Be honest with me. And so the disciples, they were clean. They were not clean by virtue of their spotless lives. They were clean because the infinite God of the universe had cleaned them up himself. And so it makes sense that Jesus said, you are all clean. Jesus cleans the disciples' feet as a symbol of the forthcoming cleanliness that they would receive uh, from his blood shed on the cross. Amen to that. So let's go back to John chapter 15 now. And let's sort of try and plug all of this in. And it's just going to make such logical sense. I mean, sometimes to a fault, like I said, but it's just going to make such complete logical sense. So as you are turning to John 15, let's just think about the condition of the disciples. Were the disciples perfect, yes or no? No, I mean, far from it. I mean, the reason why he had to wash their feet, I mean, is because they were arguing about who is going to be the greatest. The disciples still having issues in their life, still struggling with pride, and Jesus has the temerity, temerity to say, you are all ready clean. And so I want to draw a conclusion here, and I, and I assure you these are biblical conclusions, but these might make some of you mildly uncomfortable, for which I don't apologize. It made me mildly uncomfortable, but it's the truth. And it's that cleanliness in Christ must proceed to be Christian character perfection. In other words, cleanliness in Christ must precede being a perfect person. But guess what? You will never come to that point in your life where you are at Christian character perfection if you are not confident about your present tense position in Christ, your cleanliness in Christ today. In other words, what I'm saying is, how can you reach Christian character perfection? What we call it is sanctification. Sanctify. Make holy. That's what the word sanctification means. Just make holy. And you won't get to that point in your life if you do not believe that you already are, in fact, clean in Christ. In other words, you cannot stay where you are. If you don't know you're there, how are you going to continue to stay there? It doesn't make any sense, does it? Not logical sense. It's not theologically sound. And it's not grammatically sound. And so John chapter 15, let's go back to verse 1 and let's read it again. I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Today's scripture reading, you are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. And what is the very first word in verse 4? It is abide. Jesus could not tell his disciples to stay in Christ, to abide in Christ, until he made it crystal clear in their minds that they already were, in fact, in Christ. He cannot tell his disciples to remain where they don't know they are. So he, st- so he says, you are clean, not because of what you have done, but hallelujah, because of what I have done. Now stay there. Stay where? Stay in that faith relationship, trusting to what I have done for you. I mean, it makes such logical sense. Just like we said, just try saying some, staying somewhere where you're not. You can't do it. You can't stay somewhere where you're not. And so Jesus says, abide in me. Stay with me. Stay there. I want you to get, I want you to get this imagery in your brain. Think of a dog, for instance. How many of you have dogs in here? Raise your hand. And so I've seen this a million, I've seen this a hundred times if I've seen it once. I mean, someone has a dog. All right, Rover, stay right there. Turns around, squirrel comes. The dog just goes shooting around the block, chasing the squirrel. I've seen this a hundred times if I've seen it once. And so that's the imagery I want you to get in your your brain. You're telling the dog to stay there, stay put, stay right there. This is what Jesus is saying. Guys, my disciples, not only his disciples, you guys, stay here. Abide in me, and I will abide in you. Stay clean in me. That's the imagery I want you to get in your brain. And so many sincere Christian people are trying desperately to remain in Christ, to abide in Christ, to be a good Christian, to live the good Christian life without having, without having confidence that they already are, in fact, in Christ. And so the disciples were good, were very good, in fact, at making mistakes, almost as good as some of us. And so, I mean, the disciples, I mean, they had, they had these ideas in their head. They were like, 
hey, Jesus, guess what? We had this idea. We went to the city, and they didn't want to receive you, so we have this idea. We want to burn the place to the ground. And Jesus is like, well, let's not think so outside of the box. <laughs> or you have the little kids, they're coming to Jesus, and the disciples are like, get away, get away. The master has no time. And then Jesus is saying, hey, suffer the little ones to come unto me. Unless you become like one of these children, you're not going to heaven. Right. Whoops. Made a mistake there. But guess what? Here's the interesting thing about the disciples. They started the day with Jesus, and they ended the day with Jesus. They were in, you could say, they were in Jesus' camp. They were in Jesus' camp. Every night and every morning, guess who they started and ended the day with? They started the day with Jesus, and they ended the day with Jesus. They stuck it out with Jesus. And so I want to flip. I want you to flip with me in your Bibles really quick to a to a passage of scripture that I'm very passionate about, that I very love. And I wasn't going to do this, but God is putting, me, putting this on my heart to say. And so, Proverbs 24, 16, I love this verse so much. The Bible says, it's Proverbs 24, chapter 24, verse 16. And I'm just going to read it to you. The Bible says, For a righteous man falls seven times and rises up again, but the wicked falls into mischief. So, I want, you to, I want to ask you a question. In the context of this verse, who falls more, the righteous or the wicked? The righteous. How many times does the righteous fall? Seven times. But the wicked, he falls by calamity. So God forbid, I mean, like we said, sometimes you're, we're trying desperately to abide in Christ, to remain in Christ. And sometimes throughout the Christian walk, I mean, it's not a smooth road. It's a little bumpy and you're walking, you're on fire for God. But the next minute you're low and you're down and out. Then the next minute you're on fire for God, but then you're on low. You're on low with God. I mean, God forbid you fall and you stay down. I mean, if you fall and you stay down, the devil has gained a victory. But guess what? When you fall, you gotta, when you fall, you have to reach out and you have to grab the hand. You have to grab Jesus. You have to go to Scripture. You have to go to Scripture. What Scripture am I reminded of? I'm reminded of 1 John 1 verse 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to what? Cleanse, Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And guess what? Man, there have been many times in my life when I have just... I've just held this book with trembling hands and tear-stained cheeks and eye, and I've come to my Lord in the morning, and I, after I know I've let him down. But guess what? I, I open First John, and I go to chapter 1, and I look, and I hope it's still there. I go to verse 8, it's still there, and I, I quickly glance down, and I see verse 10 is still there. But guess what? Every time I've looked in Scripture, First John 1 verse 9 has always been there. Amen. Not in a second, not in a moment has this verse of Scripture never been there. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I love this verse. Man, this verse just gets me so emotional because I love this verse. And so the only time 1 John 1 verse 9 will not benefit me is the one time that I don't go searching for it. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And... <laughs> I gave this illustration before. I want to give this illustration again because it is such a good illustration. So take your imagination with me for a second, all right? Use your imagination, all right? Let's pretend. How many of you have been canoeing? Any of you have been canoeing? Well, I've been canoeing before, and it was a great experience, and I loved it. It wasn't exactly the most peaceful experience, but I loved it, and it was great. And so imagine with me that you're canoeing. We're sitting in a canoe. I love this illustration. We're sitting in a canoe, and we're canoeing. Let's say we are in, hmm, what state should we be in? What state? Florida? Okay, Florida. Let's say, oh, they don't have any bears or, well, let's just pretend with me. We're using our imagination, all right? So imagine we're in a canoe. We're canoeing. Oh, look at the scenery. It's a nice, it's a nice blue sky. There are no clouds. We're in Florida, so it's, it's about 90 degrees, 100% humidity. You're burning sweat, but you're enjoying the view, amen? You're enjoying the view. And so we're canoeing. We're in Florida, but let's just pretend with me. Oh, man, there's a moose. I didn't know there were mooses in Florida. There's a moose. We're canoeing. We're canoeing. Oh, look, there's a bear. We have bears in Florida. Canoeing. Oh, look, a beaver. I've never seen one of those before. But stay with me here. Stay with me here. All right? But all of a sudden, in the distance, we see somebody. There's somebody drowning. Oh, no. There's somebody drowning. And I'm not going to attempt to try and do the illustration here, but you get the point. Somebody is drowning, and they're like, oh, help, help, help. So that's option A. All right, I'm going to give you another option, all right? All right, imagine with me again. We're in the canoe. We're in the canoe. 
and we're canoeing. Oh, look, there's the moose. Oh, man, there's the bear. Oh, there's the beaver. And then all of a sudden, we see somebody there. Actually, no, we don't see anybody there. We hear a thump. Uh-oh. And we look down, and we just see a body, a body like this. And it's just thumping, and it's thumping, and it's thumping. And all you hear is just a thump. And I'm not going to I'm not going to ask you what's what's uh what's option you would rather see. <laughs> I'm not going to give you guys the chance to pick the option you would want to see. But guess what? Would you rather see option A or option B? Which one? I just gave you I just told you I wasn't going to give you the option, but I just want to see where your hearts are at. Option A or option B? Rescue. Option A. Why? Rescue. Rescue because there's still hope. Rescue. Because there's still hope. So don't miss this illustration here. Guess what? Don't miss this illustration. The struggle itself is a sign of life. The struggle itself is a sign of life. I mean, praise God that you're struggling with sin. I mean, the struggle with sin doesn't happen until conversion. Unrepentant, unconverted sinners do not struggle with their sin. In fact, the struggle itself is, man, how can I do this more? Like, oh, man, I I wish I didn't have to go to sleep so I can go sin some more. Unrepentant, unconverted sinners do not struggle with their sin. The struggle with sin begins until conversion. And if you're struggling with your sin, you should praise God. Why you should, should you praise God? Because there's something in you that wants to go the opposite way that your nature, your carnality, the devil, and the world is taking you. And so it's like a war that's in your flesh, as Paul describes it in Romans, I believe. It's like a war. I'm warring with myself in my flesh. So praise God that you're struggle, struggling. And guess what? One of these days, if you keep staying with Jesus, if you keep abiding in Jesus, if you keep you keep falling, but you grab the hand and you keep getting back up. Guess what? You're going to fall from that sin. One of these days, you're going to trip and you're going to fall. And one of these days, you're going to fall and you're going to get up from that sin for the last time. And then you're going to walk, get up and you're going to walk away with it. Walk away from it. Amen, everyone. That's the faithfulness and the greatness of God and who God is. Faithfulness. Oh, God is so faithful. God is so good. And so, by the grace of God, I mean, actually, let me say something really quick. Paul, when he, was, when he was writing to the church of Galatia, Paul, he said, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Confusion, you started this whole thing by faith. Now are you made perfect by the works of the law or by the works in the flesh? No, 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 no. Salvation is by faith. You are justified by faith. You are sanctified by faith. And you will be made, and you will be glorified by faith. There's no, there's no point in the Christian experience where, where, where it quickly transitions. It's by faith, and then it's by works. No, it is by faith. Look what it says in Hebrews 12, verse 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Salvation is by faith from the beginning all the way through to the end. And by God's grace, you're going to fall, and then you're going to get back up, and you're going to dust yourself off. And guess what? One of these days, your peri- those periods of mistakes, your, those periods, your, your foibles, your faults, your inconsistencies will grow further and further apart, and your victories will become more uh, numerous and will become more consistent. And guess what? One of these days, you're going to look in the mirror, and you're not even going to recognize who that person in, is because God is working. Glory to God. Glory to God. And so it's like this. You're like, want, 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 want. Do you understand the imagery I'm trying to paint paint into your head? And so the struggle itself is a sign of life. And we can always communicate our struggles as if it's bad news. But praise God that you're struggling. Because one of these days, you're going to get up from that sin for the last time. And remember, like, like, I just, like we just came to the c- conclusion that um, you are justified by faith, you are sanctified by faith. What do we say the definition of sanctified means? Sanctify, make, sanctification, sanctify, make holy. That's what the word means. So sanctification is by faith, and you will be glorified by faith. So Jesus is saying here, abide in me. Stay in that faith relationship, trusting to what I have done for you. Yeah. Amen. And so, I want to go to the book of Matthew. Turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Matthew. And we're talking about Christian growth. We're talking about abiding in Christ. So turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5. As you're turning in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5, 
This is the Sermon on the Mount. And so in the previous chapter, Jesus got baptized and stuff. And so this is, in essence, Jesus' Jesus's, uh, first public address. So Jesus, we're talking about the Sermon on the Mount, but specifically we're going to talk about the Beatitudes. And so, uh, <laughs> and so some of us, you know, we look at the Beatitudes and we're like, oh, that's a, that's a cute uh, pro, uh, proverbial, uh, proverbial statement. I'm going to hang it on my bathroom kitchen. And there's nothing wrong with that, but I just want to show you that there's something more there. So Matthew chapter 5, we're in Matthew chapter 5, and we're talking about the Beatitudes here. And I just want to show you really quick, by the grace of God, maybe you haven't looked at the Beatitudes in this way. And so the Beatitudes, in some, in some way, it's like, a, it's like a spiritual ladder. It's a spiritual what, everyone? Spiritual ladder. And so Matthew chapter 5, verse 3, Jesus says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed, happy are you when you realize you're spiritually poor. Happy are you when you realize your spiritual poverty. And notice the verb tense here. In the English language, we have three verb tenses. We have past, present, and future. So which verb tense is? is? It's present tense. So Jesus is saying, hey, happy are you when you realize that you're spiritually poor. Because when you come to the foot of the cross, when you come to the foot of the cross, I mean, I mean, you see, you see, you come to the point, when you come to the foot of the cross, you realize that, hold on a second, God, Jesus died on the cross for me, the cross was done for me, but it was also done by me. Amen, everyone. I'm going to say it again. The cross was done for me, but it was also done by me. And so, you realize your spiritual condition, you realize that, hey, I am spiritually poor. Happy are you when you realize you're spiritually poor. The kingdom of heaven belongs to you. Amen. Verse 4, Jesus says, Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. And notice the verb tense here. It changed. Blessed are you. Happy are you when you mourn. So when you realize your spiritual condition, you realize that, hey, I'm spiritually poor, you begin to mourn your spiritual condition. And so continuing down, Jesus says, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And so notice the verb tense is still the same. And so when you... so. Climb, and be, climb with me to the ladder. You recognize your spirit, spiritual condition. You mourn your spiritual condition. And now this, this doesn't cause you to be prideful. This doesn't cause you to be haughty. It causes you to be humble. That's what Jesus is saying. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. You're, you start to become humble. You realize that, hey, there's nothing good inside of me. So you're humble. But guess what? You need something if you're spiritually poor and you're mourning that spiritual condition. And now you're humble. You need what? You need righteousness. Jesus says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for food. Nope. nope. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. And so, continuing down this ladder, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. So you realize you're the undeserving recipient of God's mercy. So you want to extend that arm of mercy to other people. You begin to be merciful to other people. And so guess what? Continuing down, Jesus says, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. I mean, what are we seeing? Rejoice ye pure in heart. And so when, you're, when, you, when you reach out to other people and you want to be merciful to other people because you realize you're the undeserving recipient of God's mercy, your heart becomes pure. God makes a change in your heart. So climb with me, climb with me to the ladder here. Blessed are those who what? Blessed are those who what? Mourn. Mourn. No, blessed are those who what? Who are poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Yep. Blessed are you who what? When you mourn your spiritual condition. So you're, so you're spiritually poor, you realize I'm spiritually poor, and now you're mourning your spiritual condition, and now you become meek. You become humble. And then after that, you need righteousness. You hunger and thirst for righteousness. And then you want to be merciful to other people. You extend that arm of mercy to other people. And now your heart is becoming pure. And so continuing down the ladder here, continuing down, Jesus says something interesting. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. So peacemakers. Peacemakers in the sense that when we have evangelistic series, when we have Bible studies, we're, we're essentially we're saying, hey, God has made peace with you through Jesus. And so now we become peacemakers and we shall be called what? The sons of God. Of course, after the son of God and Jesus is the prince of peace. And so when we tell people about what God has done through Jesus, how he has made peace with us through Jesus, we, are, we, we become peacemakers. Amen. Climbing down the ladder here. 
We are at the apex of the mall. Thank God for water, right? We are at the apex of the mall. Climbing the ladder, we're at the top. Verse 10, Jesus says, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And so you're so filled with the Holy Spirit that people begin to persecute you. Satan, Satan doesn't like that. You become a threat. You're known by the demons. And so you become a threat, and now you're being persecuted for righteousness' sake. But guess what? Do you see the verb tense here? The verb tense has changed. What does he say? For, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven belongs to you. And so you know what Jesus is saying here? He's saying, guess what? You may be at the bottom. You may, you may, be, spiritually, you may be spiritually poor. You may realize that you're spiritually, that you're, there's nothing good in you. You know, when I think about that, you know who I'm reminded of? I'm reminded of the thief on the cross. The thief on the cross, he didn't have time to, he didn't have time to, to have a Bible study. He didn't, he didn't have time to do anything. The only time he had, the only thing he had time for was to put his trust in Jesus. Amen. Amen. And so I'm reminded of the thief on the cross. And guess what Jesus says? Jesus looks at him and he says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, you're going to be with me in paradise. And so, but notice the verb tense here in the beginning. Blessed are those who are poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Verse 10 now, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You know what Jesus is saying here? You may be all the way at the bottom. You're, you're, you, you, recognize you're spiritually, you're, you recognize you're spiritually poor. Or you may be sort of in the middle. You're, you're extending that arm of mercy to other people, and your heart's becoming pure. Or you may be at the top. You may be at the apex of the mall, and you're being persecuted for righteousness sake. But guess what? Yours is still the kingdom of heaven. No matter where you are in the spiritual ladder, guess what? Yours is the kingdom of heaven. Praise God. And so, by God's grace, I hope you learned something about the Beatitudes, and I hope you can look at them. Look at it just a different way, how it's a spiritual ladder. And so, as I am beginning to close here, I just want to say something. I mean, a lot of us are struggling. A lot of us are trying to abide in Christ. But guess what? This is the whole trick to succeeding in the Christian walk. You have to keep getting up. Amen. Like the righteous man. The righteous man falls seven times, but he rises up again. So keep getting up. You have to stay with Jesus. You have to abide with Jesus, and he will abide in you. Amen, church. Yes. Yes. So, Hallelujah. as I am getting ready to take my seat, I want to leave you with this verse. Never forget this as long as you live. We already discussed it. We already know what Jesus means here. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. Amen and amen.